Good evening. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined tonight by Tyler Cowan. Tyler is an individual of such varied uh, interests, activities, and accomplishments that it is almost impossible to give him a comprehensive introduction, but I will try. Uh, Tyler's day job is that he is the chairman of the economics department at George Mason University. Uh, where he also runs their Mercatus Center, which seeks to bridge the gap between academic ideas and real world problems, uh, which is something that Tyler is particularly good at. He's also a prolific author, uh, having written over 15 books, including The Complacent Class, which is one of my favorites. He is a regular contributor to national publications like The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and uh, has a regular column for Bloomberg, which called him America's hottest economist, I would say well-deservedly. Uh, in addition to all this, he runs a, a venture philanthropy fund uh, called Emergent Ventures, which provides grants and prizes for moonshot ideas, which are ideas that will trans may seem crazy, uh, may seem impossible, but have the ability to transform the way we live, the way our world works. And uh, as you might expect, been very focused in, in recent times on responses to the pandemic, but their ideas and their ambitions um, are wide ranging and significant. And um, in addition to all of that, I'm willing to bet that, that the way many of you know Tyler uh, is the way I was first introduced to him, which is as the host of the uh, incredible podcast, Conversations with Tyler, which is required listening in my household. Um, on the podcast, he hosts uh, a veritable murderer's row of philosophers, economists, public intellectuals of all sorts, Pulitzer Prize winning authors. And if you're a regular listener like me, you will realize that my inviting him here to have a conversation with us today is something akin to inviting Michael Phelps to come swim laps with me. So uh, Tyler, I hope I can make this half as interesting as, as you do with, with your guests, but um, thank you for being here. Um, Very happy to be here, David. Excellent. One, one editor's note before we get started, uh, which is that uh, we have time not just uh, for some of my questions uh, and some of Tyler's thoughts, but for your questions as well. Please, at, at any point during this conversation, submit questions on the Zoom function. We will curate them. As Tyler likes to say, questions, please, not statements. Uh, but we will curate them and have them ready to go uh, at, at the end of the conversation. So, so excellent. So with that, Tyler, I thought, you know, I thought I'd start actually where, you know, we were just talking before um, we came on about uh, the pandemic and, and some of the things from the pandemic that will be durable. As you know, you know, our business is building materials. Something we've focused on a tremendous amount is this wave of de-urbanization. It's affected us a lot this year. Um, something you've focused on in the complacent class is this stasis, kind of physical stasis, people not moving as much as, and maybe that is a symptom of, of economic stagnation or moral stagnation and the way people just don't don't literally don't physically move the way they used to. And now people are moving, they're leaving cities, they're um, moving to, to places, not just the suburbs, but, but lots of places they didn't expect to live. Do you think that's a temporary phenomenon or do you, do you think this is uh, something durable that's changing in our society? I think much of it is durable. As yeah. we were discussing in the green room before we started, people are creatures of habit. So if you have lived in a particular city for a long period of time, you start taking that for granted, you adjust your routines to what is inconvenient in the city, then a shock comes along, the city closes up, you move somewhere else for two or three months, and that becomes your new set of habits. And part of you realizes, hey, I'm just as happy here, maybe my taxes are lower, my kids have a bigger backyard, the dog likes it better, whatever. And I think a third or so of those adjustments where people live, how they work, a third or so will stick. So people will still be doing talks and interviews by Zoom calls two years from now, and indeed more or less forever. Yeah. So do you think that, um, so, you know, even though obviously the pandemic is sort of awful and not something we would, we would wish on the country, do you think that forcing mechanism of forcing people to change their habits or, or relocate um, 
you know, is is positive, either from an economic point of view or just or just from a point of view of people's kind of emotional growth and happiness. I think the short run mental health costs are really very high, higher than many people realize. But the mid to long term gains, realizing that work from a distance goes better than we used to believe. You know, my podcasts, I used to insist on doing them all face to face. Mm -hmm. I would fly to Boston. I would fly to, you know, San Francisco. And oh, terrible to do them, you know, by Zoom or Skype. And now I've done almost a year of them online. I've asked listeners, well, is it any better? Is it any worse? They say, I can't tell the difference. So now I scratch my head like, gee, I was wrong. I had this view based in a habit. And I'm going to do some face to face. But again, I'm simply going to stay in the new groove. And longer term, it's going to save me five days a year, just that one thing, not being in airports and so on. So I think once we get over the immediate crisis, which will take a while, uh, we'll all in essence be more mobile. And it doesn't mean you have to work in New York and live in Colorado. It could just be rather than having an expensive apartment in downtown Manhattan, well, you live in Hoboken and you come in twice a week and that works fine. There'll be right. much more of these intermediate mixed solutions. And do you think, do you think, do you think corporate America will come around to that as, as something which is functional? Or do you, I mean, do you think there's a, do you think, do, you know, there, there's a theory that goes around that you can only be productive in, in small groups. And I think, you know, perhaps the, you know, in, 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 in physical and person, perhaps we've defied that with the, with the pandemic, but you, you, do you think, uh, do, do you think corporations will be embracing of that? I think they already have. I think that the real problem is the workers, but I don't think you can do everything at a distance, especially new workers onboarding them. You could imagine companies that have a requirement. Well, you've got to show up every day for three years. And after that, you can go mixed. Mm -hmm. I think that will become a norm for a lot of big companies, again, depending on what they do. But it's already the norm, say, for Silicon Valley. And those are very, very well run, profitable companies. Right. They what never is, will go back to how it was that everyone is just there, and it never was quite that way to begin with. And and so, is there a sense in which the the pandemic, you know, has become, you know, you talked a little bit at the complacent class, and and you know, most of the people on this call haven't haven't read it, but you talked a little bit about how sometimes it takes these, you know, economic shocks to to you know, or 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 or, or some sort of shock to invigorate. A kind of kind of growth to, to shake us from our stasis. Do you think um, that you know the pandemic will serve as that when we look back? Is this do we do we have the roaring twenties ahead of this in 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 some sense? I think we have both the roaring twenties and the roaring fifties. Mm -hmm. So if you think about World War II, it was a major crisis. We finally get our act together on both the computer and the airplane. Uh, those are big deals. We also get out of the Great Depression. The war was a terrible tragedy. Uh, we invent nuclear power, right? And nuclear weapons, yep. which whatever their problems may be, have protected us. So I think the biomedical sciences are, are already now much faster than they had been. mRNA vaccines are a big deal. Artificial intelligence has progressed an enormous amount in just the last year. This new protein folding result is a big deal. Uh, SpaceX, solar energy, GPT-3, area after area, you see in the last year, just phenomenal gain. Some of that, of course, is just coincidence. Yeah. But I think this heralds a new time where people will go a bit crazy. Discourse will be often unpleasant, uh, but we're going to be a lot more creative and innovative. Mm -hmm. That deep mind was the uh, the protein folding. It was, was Google's, um, Google's artificial intelligence uh, work that that solved a problem that you know at least based on the headlines had not been solved for 50 years is that um, yes i am told by experts this will be a great help yeah. in designing new medicines that it's truly a big deal it will help mm -hmm. us figure out nanotechnologies to target bad medical events before they really hurt us right we will look back on it probably as a major breakthrough right so you you're 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 fairly optimistic about the next decade what um well, let's say the next decade, the next two years are a big, big mess. Yeah. So uh, we can't party too quickly. 
And I think like the end of World War I, once things turn, the Spanish flu ends, right. people are very open and you might say lax in their morals would be the polite way to put it. <laughs> and maybe we'll see some of that too in, in America. Yeah. One, um, one of the things we talked about that was, uh, you've talked about a lot, which was a constraint on growth, which is near and dear to our hearts is, is you know, the, the fact that we don't build things anymore. Um, the, you know, we don't build them in the way at the speed that we used to, right? And this gap that emerged between, you know, what we build in the physical world and what we build in the digital world. Um, can you talk a little bit just for, for the group, um, you know, on, on the phone today about your, your ideas in that area and also, you know, if you see that also converging um, or changing as, as we move into the next decade? Well, as Peter Thiel has pointed out, for a long time, we've had a lot of innovation in the world of bits. Google is still pretty new. It's phenomenal, right? Wikipedia. Uh, people disagree as to which social media they like, but we certainly spend a lot of time with them. Smartphones are only 11 years old, but so much of our daily lives, our traffic jam, that the hospital and our health insurance company don't treat us very well. Uh, I live in a home built in 1960 or so. It's fine. I'm happy here, but the fact that I can still live in such a home, in a way, it's a little depressing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a car from 1960 would be awful to drive, right? Home from 1960, I mean, I'm going to ask you, what is the innovation coming to chimneys? And that is a sign that we will have moved from the world of bits innovation to the world of physical things innovation, truly. So how is my roof and chimney going to be different or my daughter for my daughter? Well, I, you know, it's good. I, I, I think I, you know, I think the advent of solar, I think, you know, producing power um, where people live uh, and being able to store it. And so having, having cheap energy, having green energy, right? Because I, I think, and it, you know, it goes to this question of, you know, maybe whether we're trying to maximize growth or, you know, kind of uh, quality of the environment or both. Um, but, but being able to produce power where we live to being able to store it locally and have a, a distributed, a distributed grid, I think will be, you know, and, and that's going to happen on the roof will be a, 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 one of the key innovations, you know, in 10 years, you won't build a roof without, without at least being asked and thinking, should it be a solar roof? So in 30 years, what kind of awesome chimney will you be selling me? <laughs> My current I... chimney is okay, but I don't use it. It sits there, right? It's a chimney. What I mean, can I look forward to? I, you know, and, I mean, I think you're going to get, you're going to hold, see a whole set of changes in, you know, in material science and the way we, in the way we build things. We only make, you know, chimneys in Europe, so it's not, uh, it's not as big a market for us. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, but you will have a, you know, I think our ability to, to, to integrate electronics. So it's, it's this question of the digital meets the physical. Um, I think this ability to integrate electronics is going to be to be key, but I think it, you know where we can build and how much we can build is is still one of the biggest constraints on growth, right? So it's the biggest, I think. Most suburbs, cities, it's hard to get the permits to build affordably. Right. Stopping upward mobility, it worsens income inequality. In the old days, the way you worked your way up was you moved to somewhere like New York City. You stayed in a flop house or even a hotel on Fifth Avenue. It, it now sounds insane to us. You paid tiny rent and you got a job. And there right. was much less credentialism. All that is now impossible. And I would like to see us take some steps back to some parts of that world. Most of all, that more things are built more of the time. And the new things we build are much better than the old things. What are we the right there yet? But I think yeah. we are seeing that we're turning that corner. What are what are what are you what do you see as the, the the key things that are inhibiting that? Some of it is simply the law. You have homeowners who understandably don't want more traffic. They don't even know what the new project entails, but their initial bias is just to be negative and to fight it. But I think also traffic is a general problem. We need to price our roads, sometimes build more, uh, invest more in mass transit in some cities, so that mm -hmm. people don't mind there being more traffic, so to speak. Uh, but I think also the size of lots, parking requirements for retail, uh, we just don't use land very effectively in most parts of America. 
And, you know, you watch like these Star Trek movies. Oh, what does San Francisco look like in 2450? And it looks amazing. And we're not getting there. And we need to get there. And I think we will. And I think we can. Do you, do you think, I mean, the, the, the NIMBY issues have been almost impossible to solve in big urban cities. And, and, and those cities have, you know, become costlier and costlier. Do you think what we were talking about in terms of just technology allowing people, it's still a big country, right? Um, right. And allowing, allowing, allowing technology, allowing people to, to move around the country in different ways may just, may just obviate the problem if it doesn't solve it. I mean, that's certainly happening. Nashville is now a great city. Chattanooga is becoming yeah. a quite good city and so on. But I think it gets back to your point about crisis. When San Francisco and New York City have their fiscal crises, only then will they budge from NIMBY because they will have to. They will need the tax revenue. And then they will become great, vibrant cities again in a way they are not now. It's very interesting. You watch these old Alfred Hitchcock movies set in San Francisco, which yeah. are old movies. They're like 70 years old. It's like, I recognize that. I re It's sort of the same. And I want to live in a world where I am embarrassed to live in my current house. And, you know, you and others are going to bring me there. Hmm. And I want San Francisco as it is now, you know, to look ancient and not look current. And so, all that will come while Nashville becomes a wonderful place. I know you have you have libertarian instincts, as do I. Um, but but so many of the breakthroughs that have happened, um, you know, in terms of technology, happened with starting with government and then got transferred to you know to the. Um, private sector in some ways got filtered down, right? Um, it's not not universally true, but it, 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 there's certainly a, a story there. Um, it is should 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 government be taking a more active role in in building the future in this way and fundamental research and um, you know in 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 technologies in 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 investing in whether it's green energy or things like this. I'm a big believer in government support of science, but I think we need to do it better. Much of it has become too bureaucratic. Uh, when mm -hmm. I started a program of mine in April to fund scientists working on COVID-19, I pulled a bunch of them and I said, why don't you get money from the government? And they said, well, we can, but by the time we apply and it's approved and refereed, you know, it will be six to nine months. Right. And this is a pandemic. So the point of my program was to get the money within two weeks. And we need our government to be more dynamic, more like our government was, say, in World War II, uh, to take on big initiatives and do them very quickly with a smaller number of goals, you know, not job creation, not making the world more fair, although that's a good thing, but the goal has to be develop some new technology, and in mm -hmm. the longer run, the world will be more fair, but right. not build those in as goals, and in a sense, be more ruthless. So I do view science as a public good. You need private sector. I think you need public sector. Operation Warp Speed has been wonderful, uh, but that's the exception, not the rule. How did you make the decisions in two weeks? We had a panel of 20 referees mm -hmm. and a head referee. And uh, the whole kind of process was only two other people with zero bureaucracy and I and the other person worked on it full time. And that is all we did. And we had no goals other than getting money to top scientists quickly. And if that is your only goal, you can do it in two weeks. Mm -hmm. I had backup support staff that made the payments, but the right. actual decisions, two people, no other priority. It would always be the first thing I did every morning, afternoon, evening, and the last thing I did. And it can be done. Right. And we uh, basically allocated $43 million to scientists fighting COVID at a time when most of the government, the works were still gummed up. Right. What, um, what do you think of the idea, while we're talking about you know, government's role in all of this, what do you think of the idea? I mean, clearly fewer people go into government service today than they did um, years ago, right? When we talk about the 40s, obviously it was the World War, but even the 50s, 60s was a golden age of government service. Um, now many people go to Silicon Valley or they go to Wall Street. You know, what do you think? And I know you've written about Israel and the model there. 
um, who has a, a model of, you know, part of it's through the military, but a model of universal service. You know, what do you think about asking everybody to, to serve for two years? It doesn't have to be in the military, but to serve for two years, to, to you know, do something, you know, build something, you know, be part of a, a model of service for a few years. Do you think that would be effective or? I don't know what we would do with them and the fact that we can't really easily fire them. I tend to feel that works better for small, very unified countries. So places like Switzerland uh, mm -hmm. or Singapore, I think we should pay people to work in the government much more, especially at higher levels. At higher levels, I would raise their salaries by a factor of three, four, or five. Uh, Singapore does this. I think we would attract more talent. It would more than pay for itself. I think we have a big problem that, say, our own Army, Navy, Air Force don't want a draft. Mm -hmm. I don't blame them, but that's, well, what if we had universal national service? I think it just becomes a hot potato that no one knows how to handle. Right. I know, I know you've, you've, talked a lot about um, the, you know, economic growth and the importance of economic growth, but um, how do we think about the trade-offs between economic growth and, you know, things that I think we're spending a lot of time thinking about today, like environmental justice or social justice? For example, is NIMBYism a, is it a social justice issue or is it an economic issue or is it both? I think it's both. And I think uh, the biggest sustainability issues, such as climate change, require science for us to solve them. Science requires economic growth. Science will never be the top priority of most of any population. So you need a lot of surplus. Uh, you need a government budget that isn't just all going to you know, supporting people's well-being. That's important, but you need something extra. So I think the path to sustainability is more growth and innovation. You know, mm -hmm. there's no heading back to some 17th century world where we're all out in the cow pasture. <laughs> uh, we would, you know, be dying of coronavirus or have many other serious problems. Do you do you feel that there is, and maybe, you know, highlighted by the, the virus, but do you feel there is more skepticism of science today than there was? Um, more debate about science, or has it always been that way? It's always been present. I think now there's more polarization about science. Mm -hmm. So on a given issue, the people who are pro-science are very pro-science to the point of being dogmatic. Like they'll listen to Fauci, who has said many good things, but in my view is not always correct. Right. And they'll simply say like Fauci is great, you know, the people who criticize him are bad. And then the people who are not really on the side of science, uh, they become more extreme. And then on some other issue, you know, who, who is pro-science, who is not, might flip. So I think it's a, a very weird setup. Few people are consistently pro-science and more debates like over masks are, are polarized. Yeah. So I don't think that's good, but I think there is this newfound enthusiasm for science more than 10 years ago. Uh, this Elon Musk is such a hero to so many people. SpaceX, yeah. you send the rocket up and it, it relands again and you can reuse it. I mean, people see this on TV. Like they're not stupid, they get, wow, people did this. And I think young people especially are very excited about what science can do for us. Yeah. Talk about economics as a science. What, uh, where, where, you know, where do you see the value in, in your training as an economist and now, you know, as an investor, as a, you know, philanthropist, you know, deploying capital to people? Um, you know, where, where do you see kind of the explanatory value of economics being most useful? Where do you see its shortcomings? I know, well, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think economics is maybe two thirds art, one third science. <laughs> so th there's some things we know, like rent control usually doesn't work. Right. The big sudden contraction of the money supply almost always causes a recession. Mm -hmm. Governments cannot spend indefinitely. There's a bunch of things we know that the rest of the world often doesn't, that we can just repeat. And then we're very good at asking questions and we're good at being skeptical about people who think they know everything because those people don't always see the trade-offs. Right. Most issues, I don't think we can give you certain fully credible scientific answers. I'm not even sure they're there. So if an economist is telling you, well, exactly do this and this and that, and uh, be skeptical. There's some things we know, those are very important. Uh, 
a lot of the key questions we don't know. Are there are there key aspects um, of you know economic growth that that you think or 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 or, or the life the way it's lived that you think you know the economic picture is failing to capture right now? Well, if you mean right now under COVID, I think the loss of well-being from people feeling restricted or feeling stressed or not having a sense of the end goal to this process. Uh, we cannot model very well as economists. We don't know how high those costs are. My personal subjective view is they're probably pretty high. Right. Uh, but macro and micro were not designed for a pandemic, mostly. Right. They're not always good at it. So I think economics should feel a little humbled. But right. we, you know, we do know uh, some basic things. And, you know, bridge assistance to small businesses has been a good idea. I feel we knew that we did it. We also know the government shouldn't try to take those things over and try to run them. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of the rest is pretty in fog. How has how has the training uh, changed your thinking? Training as an economist. Well, I'm an unusual case because I decided early on I wanted to be an economist when I was like 13, 14 years old, and I just studied economics every day from that age. Economics, and you'll appreciate this philosophy. I know that was <laughs> still is your thing. So by the time I went to graduate school, I really knew a lot of the material, not every single thing. Right. Uh, my main training is self-taught. So I think what graduate school taught me is just how smart and hardworking the very most successful people are and how to take that as a role model. I learned that more than like learning some theorem of economics. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Did you study philosophy? Well, I've read it and studied it my whole life. I only had one philosophy class. At Harvard, I sat in on Hillary Putnam's philosophy of language class. Oh, wow. Wine and Kripke and Derrida. And that was fantastic. It's my favorite class of all time. Uh -huh. Putnam was a great teacher. Yep. Brains in a vat. Brains in a vat. Uh, yeah. And he brought it all to life. But every year, you know, I read philosophy. I talk with my friends about philosophy. So it's a very active thing for me. You know, I reread uh, Gorgias by Plato not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, just right. to stay fresh in that. If pe people are reading more during uh, the pandemic now, do you have, uh, if you had to recommend uh, uh, one thing, what would, it, what would it be, Plato? It depends on your degree of focus. Most people I know who are sort of on average well-educated have found they have less focus and they're reading more short things and fewer long things. Yeah. So I might even say like plays of Shakespeare, which are not that long, right? Yep. And they typically have a lot of momentum in the plot. Yeah. So I think everyone thought, oh, I'm locked in. I'm going to tackle all those thousand page novels that I never got around to reading. And we've observed exactly the opposite. People with more time on Twitter, uh, reading more research papers, more little itty bitty things, essays. So that to me is interesting. It's a sign uh, of our franticness. But if you can read Plato uh, during a lockdown, uh, more power to you, do it. Nietzsche, right? Uh, I, you studied Nietzsche, didn't you? Yes, yes but also, also philosophy of language. I had, I, you, will, you will be pleased to know I still owe a, a paper on Quine that I forgot to turn in because I was uh, so busy my, my senior year. So one day I will, I will send in the, the, the paper on Quine. Um, do you believe in the analytic synthetic dichotomy? No, not anymore. Not either. <laughs> do numbers exist? I, 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 you know. <laughs> so my last, my last class, my last class, uh, it was on on whether numbers exist, uh, which is a huge problem. My favorite, I think I told you this. My favorite answer was from a famous mathematician who said. Um, um, do, do numbers exist? Uh, this was a guy named Gerbel. He said, do numbers exist? And uh, he was asked, do numbers exist? And his answer was, yes. And they said, well, how do you know? He says, because I see them. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, um, I think they have to exist, um, but I think it, it creates a huge problem for, for philosophy. 
Um, and and that was uh, that was a rabbit hole I really enjoyed going down when when I was in when I was in college. Um, while we're talking about things which do or don't exist, tell us your thoughts on UFOs. There's all this new evidence, fairly new evidence, out from the Navy, where you see footage and there are radar reports, and no one is sure what to make of it. And I just did an interview with John O'Brennan, who was head of the CIA for four years. This interview will be released in two weeks. You'll be able to hear it or read it. John is first a smart guy and second has access to all the information. And I said, John, what's going on here? And he talked around it a bit. And I said, John, what's going on here? And he said, I genuinely don't know, but we need to be prepared for the possibility that there are beings on other planets. So that's the head of the CIA. Yeah. He was not saying it's real. He's not saying little green men are visiting us. But to him, I think that's a candidate explanation. And that, that, that those are alien drones, I give that like a one to 5% chance. I think well, it's unlikely, but you can no longer say it's impossible, ridiculous, just nonsense. It is yeah. an option. I, I think there's two questions, whether they're, they visited or, or whether they exist, but, but isn't it isn't it, given the size of the universe, almost irrational maybe to think that they don't exist? Yes, and we discover more and more planets that at least appear inhabitable. So you would expect visitors in some way. Again, it doesn't have to be an exotic science fiction story. Maybe they just send drones, which take in information. And when our planes approach, the drones run away. And that's all we're ever going to see of it. Uh, do, do, do but even Harry Reid, who was, you know, in the <laughs> Senate, highest security level of anyone, and uh, he said he thinks there's something to it. Yeah. So I think you can't just totally dismiss it. I, I don't think so either. Do you think it would be good news or bad news if we found out they, exi they existed? And It depends what we find out, but I think stock markets would fall. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Be short. Long you would, Bitcoin. <laughs> you would take it as bad news. <laughs> Long Bitcoin. Uh, for me personally, the curiosity value would outweigh the costs, but right. I think the disruptions would be so high. The best scenario would be to realize there are drones that run away from us we'll never catch and just know there's something there, but never know anymore and never be contacted, like the Star Trek Prime Directive. Interestingly, I found, because I think they're parallel arguments, there are many more people worried about a singularity about you know, machines gaining intelligence in some sort of, you know, Terminator type scenario, or or even in a positive scenario, um, machines gaining intelligence than aliens having intelligence. Do you, do you, are you skeptical of that, or are you? Do you think that will is possibly happen? I mean, machines, uh, you know, they they find out how proteins fold. They can beat you and me at chess now, especially you. Uh, I think it will happen. I'm not sure they will end up self-aware in the way that humans are. They yeah. might just be very, very good cash registers. Right. It's not my main worry. My main worry is human stupidity more than artificial intelligence. Right. And just that we destroy ourselves with the weapons, more or less we already have, somewhat right. more powerful, but right. we already have that capacity. And I'm 50 times more worried about that than I am like Terminator, Skynet goes live, whatever exotic scenario you have. Right. We're what, very capable of doing ourselves in. For those who don't know, um, Tyler was the youngest, I believe, youngest New Jersey State chess champion, right? Correct. I was 15. You were 15. When, when you were, when you, well, two questions. One, first question is, when you did that, do you ever imagine computers would, would be humans at chess? No. In fact, I read in Chess Life and Review all these articles by a guy named David Levy, who explained very eloquently why this was impossible and could never happen. <laughs> these pieces were really convincing. They weren't just some, you know, jerk mouthing off. He, he understood computer science. They were very thoughtful. And the fact that David Levy then was so wrong has shaped my thinking about a number of things. That medium to long term, the future tends to surprise you in the short term, progress is slower than you think. But right. at some point you wake up and it's like, whoa. And I think we're entering some of those moments now. 
Right. Is that because change is exponential in people? I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot in, in terms of a pandemic. People are just very bad at, at understanding exponential growth. It's just there's a little, 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 and then there's a lot. I think that's part of it. And people are bad at seeing around corners. So you can tell them, you know, what you see will grow, just like children grow, uh, crops grow. But the notion that it will turn into something eventually totally different, uh, much harder for them to wrap their minds around that. Have you watched uh, Queen's Gambit? I have watched all of Queen's Gambit, of course. What did you think? I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, as a chess player, things about it bugged me. Yeah. As a, a watcher of television, I, you know, they make the move too fast. Of course, for TV, you have to. And she rises to the top far too quickly mm -hmm. without ever being badly beaten for a number of years, which happened even to Magnus Carlsen. Uh, as an actress, she's phenomenal. And uh, just to bring chess to people's attention, and it was fun and somehow, to me, alive on the screen. So we watched them all, my wife and I. Okay. We've got a few more minutes. So if, if anybody has questions, I, I encourage them to, um, to submit them now uh, because I do want to get to them. Um, you know, a few more minutes before we, we go to your questions. So a, a few more things because I want to draw out, uh, you, 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 you're so adventurous in so many areas of life, um, you know, and I'd love to draw out some we, we, we are going into, um, obviously, the holidays. Uh, people will have a lot of time. People already have a lot of time at home. Um, as you pointed out, maybe people aren't doing new things, um, not nearly as much as they should during the pandemic, but, but you know, we can live in hope. Um, I'd love your thoughts on, on you know, some recommendations. Um, any, any, any book you've read this, this year that you think is, is really worthwhile? Uh, my favorite novel is by Maggie O'Farrell from Northern Ireland, and it's uh, Ireland rather, and it's called Hamnet. Hamnet. It's the story uh, of Shakespeare's mother bringing him up as a boy in times of plague. Hmm. And it's a fantastic story and uh, compulsively readable, but also philosophically deep. So that's right. Hamnet. It's like Hamlet, but with an N, Hamnet. Right. That's my book recommendation. A movie, just last night, I saw one. A director is Steve McQueen. It's 68 minutes long. It's on Amazon Prime. It's episode two of something called Small Axe. And the title of it is Lover's Rock. And it's about the Jamaican community uh, in London in 1980 and its social organization. And it's a mini drama that takes place across the span of that 68 minutes incredible music, costumes, dancing, visuals, characters, acting, everything. To me, that was an A plus called mm -hmm. Lover's Rock, part of a series, Small Acts, it's episode two. Excellent, we'll take a look. What, um, any, is, is chess still your favorite board game or? Well, I haven't played since I was 16. I watch it uh, voraciously. So just yesterday or the day before a tournament finished, where the online, the finals were Magnus Carlsen against the American Wesley So. Mm -hmm. And So actually beat him. So put in an incredible performance. So this is a golden age for watching chess. It's never been better. And uh, it's free. Just go to www.chessbomb.com and the tournaments are there. And there's computer commentary next to the game automated, speaking of AI. And it's great. Mm -hmm. Um. What about everybody's eating at home, takeout? We were, we were talking about what you did for Thanksgiving. What's um, take, things don't, some food doesn't travel as well as others. So what, what's your favorite takeout? I don't do much takeout because I'm willing to eat in the cold and I'll eat outside. I like the food at its proper temperature, but I think the best takeout is stews and curries and things with ground beef, ground lamb, uh, dishes with rice tend to sort of sit well, travel well to home. Complicated dishes tend not to. Uh, so, you know, eat outside if you can. Just, you know, be a little quick if you need to. But I find a lot of people aren't even trying to do that. I don't understand why. I know it doesn't work every day. Uh, but half the places around here have some tables outside. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, and and what what is what is your your best advice for 
um, as someone who seems always always curious, always doing something uh, for getting through the pandemic and, and not finding yourself bored? Well, I think take it one day at a time, develop some new hobbies, have some kind of list or structure that you work your way through, uh, use it as an opportunity to renew old friendships, create new ones, uh, just I don't mean take medical chances with people, but take chances with people. Like take some random Zoom calls, people maybe you wouldn't meet up with and yes. figure if they reached out to you, that it's a positive signal about them. And we're in a time, it's very hard for young people to build their networks, build connections. So if they're reaching out to you, you're, you're doing the broader world a favor, Reach back by giving them a chance to get into a better network. That's that's great advice. Um, let me let me jump to because I, I don't want to cut uh, you know our, our our group short and I can see the questions building on the call. So let me let me cut to a few questions. Um, so uh, the first one is and and you talked a lot about about uh, matching in in complacent class, but but curious if you've seen uh, this is you know from one of our team. Curious if you've seen the social dilemma, and you know your thoughts on it and kind of the current state of, of um, you know, social media. A social dilemma is that Netflix series. I haven't seen it. I, I think I broadly know what's in it. It's in negative. In America, there's much more assortative mating than there used to be. Mm -hmm. So wealthy people marrying other wealthy people, super high educated people marrying others of the same. Uh, I don't think one should criticize it. Uh, it's good for them. We don't want to be controlling who marries whom, but I do think a, a longer run unintended consequence is less mobility. So I favor knocking down credentialism in as many different areas as possible. It's terrible in academia, my own field, and just a general willingness to hire people or deal with people. And I don't just mean the like Harvard dropouts, people who don't have degrees, I'd like to see a lot more of that, and I try to do it myself. How do you how do you hire? I mean, it's it's a constant problem with for us. I know you're working on a book on this, but but how do you how do you what, what are the best ways to open that filter and 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 you know find people? I mean, everybody says they want to hire the best people. It's just you know, it, and then you always seem to show up at the same set of universities. I think you know very very often the best people from second and third tier universities are better hires from the middling people at say top 10 schools. And companies are, are realizing this, but even the best people from community colleges can be quite good hires. There's a fellowship program I run, you mentioned it, Emergent Ventures. And when people apply, uh, we never ask them where they went to school or if they finished. I don't ask them in the interview and I deliberately don't ask for letters of recommendation. Mm. Now, I don't think the whole world could be run on that basis. I get that. Uh, but I think more of it could be. Mm -hmm. If I think of the story of my own father who never went to college, he was bankrupt at 30, a failure. His pet store went under. He had to sell the chimpanzee. And by the time he was 45, he was really quite well off. Yeah. Doing that today is so much harder. And people who are disagreeable, hate homework, don't jump through the hoops. All that is harder for them. So look out more for disagreeable people, look past credentials. Uh, it, it is hard, but if you look at China, which has done phenomenally well, very little of what's gone on in China has been built on credentials because until yeah. recently, no one has had any. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so you know that's a sign it's possible, but yes, it's hard. It's very much the lesson of our industry, which is that you know the the so many of the most successful, most talented people in our in our industry worked their way up, you know, didn't have college educations, and and you know we're big believers in it. It's just a question of how you, you know, as a formal mechanism, open that filter. Another question: um, the uh, I mean, you spoke about your father, obviously, and and that was a big influence. Did you have a mentor or a hero growing up that that really influenced you? I've had mentors my whole life. I still have mentors, although now almost all of them are younger than I am. But mm -hmm. there was a fellow named Walter Grinder when I was 14. And Walter was never successful in the traditional sense, but his goal was to like read all the world's books. Mm -hmm. and just to see that as a possible way of life. 
I think so often the biggest impact you have on others is simply to be a certain way and show them a particular way of life is possible. Yeah. And this will make a great impression like on 1% of the people you meet. And the returns to that are very high. So Walter was my first and maybe most important mentor. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, what, uh, talk about what you think the future of New York City is. What is, what is it? Tell us a little bit more about what it needs to be do to be, you know, Vienna or, you know, whatever your model of a vibrant city was in history. Well, I'm pessimistic in some ways here. So as there's more work from a distance, mm -hmm. New York City is the first place a lot of people don't want to live, however wonderful it may be. So I think already the city is facing a fiscal crisis, and it's also too dependent on its top, say, 150 taxpayers. And I don't think most of them will leave, but it's not hard to imagine 10 of them leaving at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's already almost a fiscal crisis for the city. I think its population will grow. It will become much younger and more vibrant, more like the Berlin of 10, 15 years ago, but it will be dirtier, more problems paying off pensions, cleaning up the streets, delivering basic public goods, which will encourage some of the wealthiest people to leave all the more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think fiscally it will be like the 1970s all over again. The city yeah. will be broke, but ultimately more, more vibrant, more fun, less touristed, and more its own place, a bit like the 80s Andy Warhol, yeah. you know, punk rock. And the new versions of that now seem more likely. But that I don't want to live there. Yeah, the better creating a condition for a golden age. Yeah, it's what about, tough. Talk, talk about uh, a, a few questions on your, your current economic views. I mean, what, what do you see as Biden's you know, biggest economic challenge um, outside of uh, you know, coming into office? I mean, outside of obviously solving the pandemic, which you know, probably influences everything. Well, I think he's been dealt a, a lucky hand of cards from the economic point of view. The continuing loss of life will be terrible, but the vaccines work. They're remarkably efficacious. Getting people to take them is a challenge, but as people take them, there will be an automatic rolling boom for some while. Mm -hmm. I think his biggest challenge is what was already a kind of long-term bankruptcy of many state and local governments. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Illinois, yep. New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut, now New York, others likely to join that club. Uh, I'm not even sure he can control those variables, but they affect the national economy. It's not just, you know, one or two small states somewhere. And uh, he'll have his hands full with that. And a lot of the bigger plans, uh, whether you like them or not, they're just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, t thinking about the, um, you know, the shortages of skilled labor and, you know, you've talked about immigration, but there's also this, you know, you know, there's also this huge displacement of workers from one, you know, from one uh, part, from certain parts of the economy, you know, and, and potential to take them up in others. Um, you know, one, you know, do, do you think, um, how do you think about a little bit about, you know, the, the, the need for immigration here, given, given, you know, what we've been through, but also, you know, the ability to retrain workers from, one industry for to another. If 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 building is booming and, and we are built, we've overcome NIMBYism and we are building, can we take workers from service industries and travel industries and effectively retrain them? Or is that, you know, is is that really a pipe dream and we just lose a generation of workers and overcome it with technology? Workers have been very mobile across sectors during the pandemic. And I think they will continue to be. So economists predicted unemployment would be well into double digits now and it's not, uh, there's still problems. People who stopped looking for work, it's non-trivial, but labor markets recovered much more quickly. Uh, immigration to me is central. So you look at these vaccines, the key people on the teams, the CEOs, the founders, they are mostly immigrants. Mm -hmm. And the company in Germany, you know, with the mRNA vaccine that's working with Pfizer, that was founded by two Turkish immigrants the parents were Turkish immigrants to Germany, guest workers. Uh, Moderna co-founder 
is of Armenian ethnicity from Lebanon, first to Canada, then to the US. The woman running the Novavax program in Gaithersburg, Maryland, she is from Gujarat, India, grew up in a family that could not afford to buy her shoes. And she and her all female team have created what may end up being the best of all the major vaccines. So it's just like a phenomenal performance from immigrants. It is true one should do immigration correctly and responsibly, uh, but we need to get that chain moving again as quickly as possible. Right. What a few, uh, absolutely agree, by the way. Um, what is your thought on, you know, a, a few questions on advice for students? And I know you think a lot, you know, both as an educator and, you know, thinking about the future of education, um, both, you know, advice for students graduating today in, in coming into this job market, but, but also advice for young students about, um, you know, how, how they should think about maybe education differently than, than we thought about it growing up. You know, I think most good advice is very context specific, but I have two pieces of advice I give to everyone and it applies as much, you know, to us as to them. And the first is get a good mentor or mentors mm -hmm. and keep that at every stage of your life. Doesn't matter how successful you are. More than one is great, but the difference between zero and one is enormous. Mm -hmm. And then have a small group of peers that you're in touch with, not doesn't have to be every day, but like more than twice a week. And it can be online. And uh, you're working on common problems, have common interests, mostly basically get along, but with some creative tension maybe. And they're your audience, like what they think of you really matters and you'd better choose them wisely and you're gonna learn from them. Uh, so I call it small group theory. Who's your small group? Who are your mentors? applies to every stage of your life and start it as soon as you can. That to me is the advice that applies to virtually everyone. And how can you be a good mentor for the, for, you know, the people on the phone and, you know, and the call in, in, in that, in that position, how do you act as a good mentor to people? I think the easy thing is you don't have to do any mentoring. You have to be good at the thing you're good at. Mm -hmm. And if you do that visibly and openly, that is mentoring. Now, people may ask you for advice. Of course, don't turn them away, but you don't have to wake up and like write down, here's my mentoring plan and it has seven steps. No, just be you being excellent if you can. That's your mentoring. Do you, do you think, um, do you think, question on, do you think the concept is, as we think about the concept of work change in the, during the pandemic, do you think people are, maybe more focused on finding meaning in their work than just commercial success, you know, more purpose-driven or was that already very much in, in you know, um, a, a trend that was happening or is it, is it always been a place people search for meaning in their lives? I think everyone's Apple card has been overturned. Mm -hmm. Everyone is reevaluating the life they used to have. Everyone is asking like those different 11 things I used to do, did they really make me happy? Do I really need to spend money on them? Do I really need this job 10 years from now, two years from now? I don't think we know yet in the aggregate what the results of that questioning will be, but I think it will be pretty radical for, for millions of Americans. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are frozen right now. Like, okay, it's hard to find a new job in a pandemic. So you're not gonna cut your ties and give up the job you have. Right. But as recovery comes, I think people are going to make a lot of changes. What, what, what are some of the things in the life you've, you've reevaluated, reevaluated or, or would change coming out of this? Well, for quite a while, I haven't been able to travel much. So I need to think, what was it about travel I really valued? When I take my next trips, I'll now think of travel as not something that is perpetual. Mm -hmm. I'll choose them more carefully. Not even sure if I'll do more or less of them, but I'm pretty sure it will end up being a big change. And also with books I read, you, it's not that I think I'm going to die in this pandemic, but you, you see higher mortality risk and you mm -hmm. do think a bit like, what is it I really want to have been reading during these years? Do you, how, 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 do you, do you, does it change the balance of fiction and nonfiction you read? 
because of my work, I've read much, much more nonfiction, mostly about the pandemic, epidemiology, biomedical research, which I've been working on. I've wanted to read more fiction. Mm. And that's probably the long run result. But no, I've just been going crazy, like reading new research papers on coronavirus, mm -hmm. which has been fascinating, obviously a horrible subject, but I've learned more in the last year about all kinds of things than I ever thought I would have. You know, it's interesting. You were, you were, you had so many roles and accomplishments in life, um, but very late, much later in life, you've kind of become a manager um, and an investor probably more than, than you were before. What, how has that changed your view on, on some of the things you did before? Uh, I think people who are very effective are usually not the very smartest people in a narrow sense. Mm -hmm. They're people who have eight or nine different areas where they're kind of a nine on a scale of one to 10 mm -hmm. and they can put them all together and coordinate them and just be super incredibly successful. And the people who are the very smartest, I wouldn't say they're at a disadvantage, but I don't think actually they're to be envied. Mm. So to think more about people and also myself in terms of how well do I coordinate the different things I'm good at and not be too broken up over, oh, well, someone's better at that than I am. Someone's better at that than I am. It's yeah. really true for all those dimensions, very definitely. Uh, but to think more in terms of this coordination factor. Right. I think in you know, CEOs also, they're incredible coordinators. It's why, if I may refer to you, philosophy is such a great background, I think, for being a CEO. Reed Hoffman's another example. Mm. Head of Palantir, right? Philosophy background. Yeah. It's reasonably would... common, way more than you would think. Yeah, yeah. So as a uh, final question, um, and th this has been fascinating, um, you know, um, you know, as we, uh, well, two, two final questions. First is, I'm, I'm so curious with, with, with someone whose work bleeds into, into what you're interested in and what you're interested in bleeds into your work. You know, one of the things people have been wrestling with is, is uh, you know, how you separate work from leisure. So how, how do you separate work from leisure or is it a false dichotomy? For me, it's a false dichotomy, but I'm an outlier. I'm, I'm not telling anyone listening to copy me but there's no separation. Sometimes I drive people crazy. Uh, I'm high on obsessiveness. Mm -hmm. And after we're done chatting, I'm going to, you know, go back to work, but it will be fun. Uh -huh. So uh, my mm -hmm. guess is you're pretty much the same way. We will, we will, we will let you do that. One, one last question. This is, I mean, th this, there's been a lot of notes of optimism in, in your views on the future and, you know, even in the midst of what everybody's going through. So, um, give us, what, what, what are you most hopeful about looking, looking at the future? What, give us a, a note of, of optimism. Well, there's so many. I mean, a big one, and if you look at you know, the vaccines that are working, how critical has been the role of women in producing and overseeing those vaccines. Yeah. So we are mobilizing talent much, much better than we used to do. Yeah. Not only for women, that's just one highly visible example. Progress of science is turning many corners. I think today's young people, whatever you might feel you would criticize in them, uh, are kind and care about the world and have access to a lot of information. And I think we as humans are going to do some pretty incredible things with, with this hand we've been dealt. Yeah, well, it's I, I, I think you're right and I hope you're right. Let's. Let's leave it there. Tyler, this was, this was a tremendous conversation. Thank you for joining us all today. Hope we can meet sometime. That, uh, in person, let's, let's yes. do it. Terrific. Okay, so, take care, so, thank you all. Oh, if you're listening and you had a question, feel free to email me, my email's online. Okay, take care everybody, thank you. Bye.